Welcome to Back to the Text Themselves, a series on phenomenology. Today's video is part two of an examination of sections 43 and 44 of Heidegger's Being in Time. In the previous video, we considered some approaches to the problems of reality and truth prominently found in the history of philosophical thought, including the idealist philosophies of Descartes and Kant and the classic correspondence theory of truth. However, the purpose of Heidegger's analyses are not merely to criticize, but rather to set the stage for a more constructive proposal that's connected to the preliminary analysis of Dasein given thus far in Being in Time. And so in this video, the following questions will be addressed. How does reality depend upon existence? And what does it mean for Dasein to be in the truth? Prior to asking for proof of the existence of reality, Dasein is first constituted in the mode of care. Hence, Dasein is always already joined together with the world, even before asking about proofs of its existence. To ask about proof of a connection necessitates that the connection is already there, or more accurately, that there was no separation to begin with, and that it's only through an abstraction of Dasein and the things from their world that one arrives at what amounts to a manufactured problem. Reality is ontologically grounded in the being of Dasein, and that being is determined by care. This doesn't mean that the real only exists so long as Dasein exists, but that reality can only be known or unknown, comprehended or rendered incomprehensible based on Dasein, who in its care is capable of understanding the being of its being. Reality, which Heidegger distinguishes from the real, is an abstraction made possible only by a mind existing in a world that is always already directed toward that world through care. And so we return to the notion that Heidegger provided us back at the beginning of this work, though worded slightly differently this time. The substance of human being is existence. This is a callback to his earlier statement that the essence of Dasein is its existence. What this means is that rather than start from the problem of reality, that is, as substances or essences, in taking up the task of philosophy, one must begin with the more primordial problem of existence itself. For it's existence that makes reality possible and not the other way around. The question that drives Neo, the question, what is the matrix, is only a question for him because he exists. And because he exists, he's directed toward that existence through care. And through care, questions come to him, questions concerning the nature of reality. What often gets left unexplored in this analysis is the nature of existence itself. To appreciate what Heidegger is doing here necessitates that we stop defining the real as scientists do and to consider the scientific enterprise itself to be a derivative mode of knowledge, one that depends upon a more fundamental situation, that of Dasein in its being in the world as care. It's at this point we also see perhaps the closest convergence with the phenomenological mode of thought as we come across the claim that anything that can be said of material reality, of laws, of nature, of empirical facts, are necessarily encountered first and foremost as phenomena. In other words, these laws and facts of material reality are contingent upon the possibility of having a lived experience of these laws and facts. Without this lived experience, there would be no laws or facts to be reflected upon and used for whatever purposes we use them for. And yet, this is not to suggest that these laws and facts are themselves a matter of subjective experience, which would be to fall back into the trap of the subject-object dichotomy this time just favoring the subjective side of the pole. Instead, Heidegger is saying that laws and facts as laws and facts can only be approached in and through Dasein, that is, through a being who is thrown into a world and who cares about its possibilities in that world. To clarify another matter here, this emphasis on the phenomenal dimension of Dasein is also not an attempt to reestablish a dichotomy between the appearance of things 
and the things in themselves, the phenomenal versus noumenal realms as we find in Kant. The appearance of things are, in fact, the things themselves. There's nothing more basic to posit than this. This doesn't mean that what appears is necessarily given in all its fullness, only that what appears is not an abstraction, a mere representation of the thing, but a dimension of the thing itself. And so the laws of nature are given first and foremost as a phenomenon. And this phenomenon cannot be separated from these laws. This carries through with the basic phenomenological sensibility we see at play in Husserl, even if, at least in Heidegger's eyes, Husserl was unable to follow through on the radical implications of what he had begun in his call to go back to the things themselves. Prior to and presupposed by the correspondence theory of truth, that is, truth that matches representation with reality, is the encounter with truth itself. Heidegger asks, when does truth become explicit in knowing? Or turning to the matrix again, we can ask, how is it that Neo finds the truth of his situation? It's not when the representation of what Neo has in mind corresponds to what is being encountered out there in the real world. Instead, truth becomes explicit for Neo when he is shown the truth. Truth happens to us when it makes itself visible in revealing itself as true. In other words, truth is an event, making truth to be a kind of act or activity rather than a static, unchanging principle. To take an example Heidegger uses, if one states the picture on the wall as crooked, the truth of the statement is not in its logical formulation nor in being in agreement with the actual object, the state of affairs. Instead, the truth is the manner by which the statement directs us toward and allows to be seen the discoveredness of the crooked painting itself. For perhaps a more relatable example, in a class, we may read descriptions of individuals, say, with a particular psychological disturbance. In that class, we learn the list of symptoms and typical presentation of such cases. The truth of these descriptions, however, is not first based on how logically sound they are, or even how well they converge with the empirical observations. That may be a kind of truth, but it's only a derivative kind. The more primordial understanding of truth here concerns the manner in which the patient is discovered, how what was previously hidden is now made clear to me. The book knowledge, the descriptions that I read and are made available to me, only serve the purpose of making it possible to discover that truth rather than the truth itself being located in the propositions and descriptions. Through these examples, we find illustrated a profound reformulation of truth as discovering, which is more primordial than correspondence or agreement. This formulation of truth as discovering converges with the notion of aletheia that's found in ancient philosophy. Aletheia refers to a kind of uncovering, a wrenching of truth from the depths of obscurity and hiddenness. However, we're still not at the most fundamental understanding of truth here, for in discussing the discoveredness, we remain at the ontic level, even as we're shifting from a view of things as objectively present to ready to hand. An even more primordial truth is identified through this discovering and discoveredness, directing us to Dasein itself and Dasein's way of being in the world. In taking care of things, Dasein discovers innerworldly beings. And it's through this that Dasein is found to always already take care of things in such a way that discovers them. And so discovering reveals the disclosedness of Dasein itself. And as such, Heidegger claims Dasein is in the truth. So what does this mean and what is exactly is disclosed of Dasein here? First is disclosed the totality of what has become explicit by care, that being the world of innerworldly beings. Second is disclosed Dasein's throneness as in its factical existence always already being in a world with innerworldly beings. Third is disclosed Dasein's own most potentiality for being and it's projecting itself toward its possibilities. This third point discloses the most primordial truth of all, which is the truth of Dasein's existence, an existence that is determined not merely by its actuality, but by its possibility. 
And then fourth, we find disclosed Dasein's understanding as shaped by the interpretedness of the they in having fallen prey. Now, that fourth point can be confusing as it would seem that the disclosing of Dasein as having fallen prey would not be related to truth, but instead to untruth. And indeed, this is correct. We find here a manner by which Dasein is disclosed and by which it discovers in worldly things in a manner that is distorted and disguised by idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity. Here in that which is disclosed and discovered shows itself in the mode of semblance, and the truth of those things shrinks back into dissemblance and concealment. So we have to add to Heidegger's formulation that Dasein is not only in the truth, but also in the untruth. And yet, this is a truth and untruth that are both preceded by a more primordial disclosedness of Dasein as Dasein. And in its disclosedness, Dasein is on the path of discovering. A path that involves distinguishing truth and untruth understandingly and deciding for one over the other, either by willing to confront the angst of one's existence or perhaps otherwise flee from it. If Dasein is to move from an inauthentic to an authentic mode of truth, it will need to both appropriate what it's already discovered and defend against semblance and dissemblance. From this, Heidegger concludes that so long as there is Dasein, there is truth. Dasein is the one who discovers beings in their self-disclosing revelations. However, we must understand this statement in the same manner as we understood Heidegger's other claim that reality is grounded in Dasein. Heidegger neither places truth as some subjective determination nor as a matter of something eternal and unchanging. He's not positing any notion of eternal truths, for such truths are only possible if Dasein is eternal. And philosophically, there's no basis to grant such status to Dasein. As such, all truth is relative. But this doesn't mean that truth is subjective in the sense of being left to the arbitrary discretion of Dasein. For it is also truth that makes Dasein ontologically possible if we define truth as disclosing and discovering. So truth and being are eki primordial rather than truth being dependent upon being or being dependent upon truth. And so we can also say that yes, truth is relative, but we must understand this in the more literal sense of relative being a kind of relation. And in this case, that truth is a relation between truth and being. It's at this point that we have reached the midpoint of being in time, and Heidegger briefly mentions what has thus far been accomplished. Yet what remains is the most central purpose of the entire book of Being in Time. We've only been provided what he calls a preparatory analysis that has clarified being, but has yet to arrive at what the meaning of being in general is. And that will be addressed more so in part two, where we take up the concept of time, or more accurately, temporality which, perhaps surprisingly to those not familiar with Heidegger, will actually bring us into contact with the notion of being toward death. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching and until next time, be well.